So guys, I want to share some of the data of the testing that I've done recently. It's just going to be a bunch of random, unrelated comparisons between new ships that I was curious about. However, the things that I was testing was not super important, so I wasn't very rigorous in my testing for most of the questions that I had. This is just a small amount of data points which points me in a certain direction, and my experience fills in the rest, but naturally I'm going to have blind spots. Before diving into the findings, I just want to share my thoughts about testing in Azerlean in general. The reason it's not enough to just run all the numbers through a calculator, given the ship's stats and damage formulas, is because the combat is real-time, and auto mode moves more or less randomly. Barrages also have variable hit rates depending on the pattern of the barrage and the enemies you're facing. On top of that, due to stats like range and spread of weapons, each individual weapon slot also has its own unique hit rate, which must be taken into account. With that being said, there is one major class of ships whose performance I do believe can be reliably calculated, and that is carriers. All modern carrier comps have some way to ensure that the boss is not moving when their damage is going off, and almost all of it is guaranteed to land with the exception of bombs. When it comes to bombs, we can actually quite accurately predict their average hit rates against a stationary target, so as a result, Carrier calcs tend to be very reliable, assuming you're fighting against just a single enemy and all the parameters have been set up correctly. Setting up every single parameter correctly is quite a lot of work though, and it is not uncommon to overlook a single number here and there, for example air superiority or stat buffs from the officers. You must also find the stats of the enemy and need to account for every single buff and debuff from the other ships in your fleet, some of which have variable values depending on the time of the fight, such as Shinano's debuffs. Apart from carriers, calcs at best give a very very rough idea of what a ship is capable of at their peak. If everything physically lands, as most guns and barrages have their own unique hit rates, even against most stationary enemies. My favorite place to test ships and equipment is the EX stage in raid events. Here, you can infinitely repeat the same fight free of cost, usually against a single enemy with no annoying mechanics, and enough HP to last until the end if you're just testing vanguard ships. They also often do not have planes to mess with the end screen. It is easy to gather a large enough sample size to have statistically significant results. However, I believe statistical significance is a concept that is important when developing things with the potential to cause harm to people if not sufficiently tested. So even though I list the p-value sometimes for my tests, I don't think it is actually necessary to go that far in a zero lane. Unfortunately, we only get two or three of these raid events per year, just for a couple weeks. It would be really nice if we could get a permanent testing dummy mode that was infinitely repeatable. Whenever these events come around, I do a lot of testing of the entire backlog of things I want to figure out between the 6 months or so from the previous raid event. The results from these tests can be very informative on fights against single enemy fights of the same armor type. Of course there will be differences based on the mechanics of the fight and the movement of the enemy, but those differences can usually be accounted for and it doesn't make the data gathered from the raid events any less useful. If there is any drawback to these tests being so easy, it's that sometimes I will just let auto run and look at the results without checking the footage. Here's a video where I shared the data I gathered from this year's Lunar New Year raid event to see how much stronger the then newly released Taiyuan was compared to her sister Anshan. Looking at the results, the difference was a whopping 27%. However, there is more context here that I missed. Maybe because they couldn't believe the difference in barrages would make such a big difference, and they were right. They correctly pointed out that the difference in damage is due to Taiyuan firing an extra salvo of her missiles. Assuming they fire the same number of missiles, the difference is only 7% more in Taiyuan's favor as opposed to 27%. Now, I could just have hid this fact and pretended that I never made a mistake, but honestly I don't care a whole lot about being right, I just want to know the facts and share it with you guys. After thinking about it for a bit though, I came to the conclusion that Taiyuan getting an extra salvo of missiles out due to her having a reload buff instead of an accuracy buff like Anshan should not count against her, as she can fire an extra volley both in a 60 second fight as well as an 80 second fight like meta fights. She actually can in practice fire an extra volley in a lot of battles, which means that she indeed would be able to deal 27% more damage than Anshan in a given 60 second fight, a bit less in 80 second fights because both of them get an extra salvo of missiles. But if you're up against an Arbiter for example in a 90 second fight, then the difference would only be about 7% as they would fire the same number of missiles. Speaking of meta fights, old fights such as Arc Royal, 
Kiryu, Soryu, and so on could be good testing grounds as well, but unfortunately, there is a limit to the amount of attempts you can do. You can only see the result screen so many times before you run out of daily attempts, or you max out the ladder of the permanent meta fights, making them disappear forever. I hope that they will make these fights playable someday with no reward. Newer meta fights have some mechanic that make them unique from most other fights, so I find that data you get from other sources can be useful when first devising a strategy to tackle the new meta fights, but most of the things that come up while studying the fight tend to be specific to that one fight. The same goes for Arbiters in Operation Siren. Their skills have too much impact for tests conducted in those fights to carry over elsewhere. Not to mention, they send planes, suicide ships, and ads as well. You can, however, test which specific fleets have the highest success rates against the specific Arbiters, or which specific fleets kill them the fastest. While they're not technically infinitely repeatable because you will eventually run out of Operation Siren coins for healing, something which has happened to me many times in the past from doing tests against the Arbiters, you can repeat them enough times to gather whatever information you need. Everything I've talked about so far has been mostly single enemy fights, but there is an entirely different kind of battle which can be found in the main campaign stages, as well as Operation Siren Exploration. The data from single enemy fights can only be somewhat translated to campaign, and even less the other way around. For instance, New Jersey is a ship which is leaps and bounds above non-rainbow battleships in single enemy fights, but due to her lack of AoE, she can be mashed and even outperformed by SSR battleships in campaign. On the other hand, ships like Sela and Bayard, which rely on there being enough enemies on the screen for their powerful but wide barrages to hit, have impressive showings in campaign, but are complete afterthoughts in single enemy fights. There are many issues with campaign testing in itself. First, Chapter 14 introduces the night battle mechanics that make targeting extremely wonky. Chapter 15 is a bit too difficult to gimp your fleet in order to let the ships you're testing to do enough of the work for differences to properly show. Chapters 12 and under do not have enough HP to test anything that is max leveled and somewhat strong. The only stage that remains is Chapter 13. Unfortunately, as new ships keep getting more powerful, even Chapter 13 battles are starting to feel a bit too short as you can roll the 3-star carrier and battleship notes with only Plymouth and Bayard for damage while having 3 repair ships at the back. There are also times where I have to keep leaving and re-entering the stage because 3-star carrier or battleship notes refuse to spawn. And there are also a ton of planes skewing results obtained from the result screen via anti-air damage. I've already gone on a whole spiel about the end screen results misleading you and I'll link that video in the description for context. Basically, you must equalize ships' anti-air stats, which makes testing something like Felix, who has 160 anti-air, against a light cruiser like Harbin with over 400 anti-air, very difficult. I can't stress enough how important it is to gather a large sample size in Chapter 13, even after you have normalized AA stats. Even with the same AA stat, you can still have random swings of 40,000 damage from anti-air damage in a given fight, which will severely skew the results. Aside from anti-air, you also have to consider the position of each ship in the vanguard. The ship in the front slot will fire their torpedoes first, ensuring that they hit something. What about the ships after it if the first torpedoes kill the enemy? Can they also guarantee that there will be something left over to hit? This is not always a huge issue, but it is something to keep in mind. Another kind of problem is that these tests with repair ships may not be representative of real battles. While a torpedo focused ship and a firepower focused ship may deal similar amounts of damage, there are situations where the firepower focused ship may bring a target down to 20% HP, and then the main fleet strikes and finishes them off. However, the main fleet strike would have killed them from full HP anyway, so the damage that the vanguard ship dealt from 100 to 20% will have pretty much gone to waste. On the other hand, torpedo-focused ships deal damage in bursts, and those bursts are much more capable of actually finishing off entire enemies and spawning in the next wave, which is an essential part of efficient campaign clearing. There are probably many more situations similar in nature to these that I can't think of on the spot right now, but just know that damage is not necessarily the end-all be-all. Also, there's obviously going to be situations where gun-focused ships are better than torpedo-focused ships as well. One last thing I want to mention is that these tests are done with my amount of fleet tech and equipment, so the results may not be applicable to your situation, depending on how developed your account is. I'm only testing things to satisfy my own curiosity and sharing the results, not saying that this is the way things are for everyone. With all of that out of the way, let's finally move on to the data that I've been sitting on. For these tests, the sample sizes are not very big and I did not record the footage. The data I gathered here isn't super meta-relevant and I wasn't sure if I was even going to share it, so you can take it or leave it as you wish. 
First up is Friedrich Karl versus Drake. Karl attaches a barrage to the rear ship and the damage from the barrage is attributed to that ship instead of Karl. In order to see how much damage it was contributing, I first had Drake in the rear for some battles and then mains in the rear for others to see how much of a difference there was between being in the rear slot with Karl's barrage versus not. It turns out that the damage it contributes is quite significant, around 20k in battleship notes and 13k in carrier notes on average, perhaps due to the difference in duration of battles. Not only that, but even before giving the credit from the barrage, Karl already dealt more damage than Drake when Drake was in the middle slot without that barrage. With the barrage counted for, it's a complete wash in Karl's favor. Do note that I used Drake gun on Drake, but Hindenburg gun on Karl, just because she can. All equipment were plus 10. The fact that Drake is stuck with her gun is a detriment and should be held against her when necessary. Overall, I would consider Karl to be a slight upgrade over Drake in campaign, being better both in terms of DPS and bulk. However, unlike Drake, she does need the tank position, which is fine in most cases since she is very tanky, unless you happen to have another tank that's even better. Next up are Brigny and Goritzia. It seems that Hindenburg gun outperforms the Drake gun in chapter 13, and when you give the weaker heavy cruisers the Hindenburg gun, they can somewhat close the gap with Drake. However, these two are both slightly weaker than Drake damage-wise, even with the Hindenburg gun. In practice, Brigny's sword barrage never goes off because her swords are spent blocking shells from the enemy. Next up is Sela's main gun choice. Honestly, there's not a noticeable difference, but it seems like the Rainbow Twin 100 is better against carrier nodes, while the single 100 is better against battleship nodes, but it could be due to the lack of sample size, as well as the difference in AA. Just use either one, but the single is cheaper to craft and will likely end up being better for chapter 14 due to concealment. Here I also took Chapayev for a spin post augment. Her own damage seems slightly weaker than that of mains, so not too relevant in the grand scheme of things, but not weak by any means. Next up is Guishen, who ended up dealing less damage than Kuibyshev, who again is also around mains level. Guishen is decently bulky, but her damage output is not stellar. Next, I decided to test Neptune against Purple Light Cruisers because I wanted to see exactly how weak she was. All of them were equipped with plus 10 Plymouth Gun and quadruple magnetic torpedoes. Their anti-air stats were also within 10 points of each other. This is also the time where Leipzig got her unique augment. Both Liverpool and Leipzig have buffs for light cruisers, Liverpool giving 10% firepower and Leipzig giving 10% firepower, torpedo, and reload. Despite Neptune only being on the receiving end of buffs, she still ended up outputting less damage than the other two. Liverpool has a buff when your fleet's ammo is 4 or above, so I separated the battles into the ones where she had the buff and ones where she did not. If you combine the results, she's pretty much on par with Neptune in terms of damage output, if you ignore the 10% firepower that she is giving to Neptune. By the way, Liverpool is not even particularly good. She just has a decently strong barrage tied to her torpedoes and some self buffs, and that's enough to outperform Neptune, at least on the offensive side. As for Leipzig, she is a step up from the other two, dealing the most damage on average while also providing the most impactful buff. I will have to test her against some better ships later down the line. I also tested some of the new destroyers, although I did not include another French ship in the fleet for Laudacia in these tests, so she's severely underperformed. C-47 is around the level of Atelio Regolo though, and above Alum M. Sumner. Okay, moving on to the next set of tests, rather than doing side-by-side -side comparisons in the same fleet, because Laudacia has buffs for other destroyers, I ran Various destroyers alongside Shimanto and San Diego to minimize the anti-air contribution of the destroyers. All destroyers had around the same amount of anti-air stat, but San Diego and Shimanto did not, so don't look too much into their results. I also recorded the average total damage attributed to the Vanguard. This is because if the battle lasts longer, then there will be more planes to rack up anti-air damage. With this many runs, I couldn't record the battle duration for every single one, so we need to look at both the destroyer's damage, as well as the total damage as a proxy for clear time. This time, I remembered to put another French ship in the fleet for L'Audacia, which was pen levé with the Skyrocket and Brigade, to contribute as little as possible to surface damage. Wait, I actually did not run Shimanto with L'Audacia, but instead with Shimakaze. This was the first set of tests, and because the results were quite surprising, 
it spurred me to do everything else here. Since Lada Sia buffs gun damage and Shimakaze deals pretty much all torpedo damage, it was susceptible for them to be ran together. I used Shimakaze without any oxytorps and plus 10 equipment. Not how I would ever actually use her, but it is still impressive that Lada Sia managed to keep up. Then, between Felix and Mogador, it seems that Felix had higher averages than Mogador, but because the total damage in Mogador's fleet was lower than that of Felix's, it suggests that Mogador was finishing the battle sooner, and was therefore actually stronger. I also briefly checked Kawakaze and Hatsuzuki, and their damage was around the same level as Felix's, but the sample sizes were a little low. From the total vanguard damage in carrier nodes, it would seem that battles finished sooner on average with Mogador than Felix, Kawakaze, and Hatsuzuki. With that in mind, I did more comparisons between Laudasia and Mogador, using Brest in the vanguard and going back to a 3 repair ship main fleet. While La Dacia seemed to deal slightly more damage, and also noticeably increase damage dealt by Prest, the total damage in carrier nodes for Mogador was lower. Once again, lower total damage means faster battles, which is a good thing. Keep in mind that the surface ships of the same nodes all share the same HP, and the main fleet is 3 repair ships, so the difference in vanguard damage is due to anti-air damage alone, although it could be a result of random swings due to insufficient sample size. After that, I went to 13.4 hard mode instead, for its higher HP, to test the differences using plus 13 equipment. I believe I was using Ryuho, Panleve, and Illustrious in the main fleet, with Skyrockets and Briette. In side-by-side -side comparison with plus 13 equipment, you can see that Mogador is quite a lot stronger than Felix post-phase simulation. This is expected as most of Mogador's damage relies on her main guns alone, while Felix is much more barrage focused. If you do not have a plus 13 vanguard guns, then Felix is likely overall better than Mogador in campaign, definitely in survivability and very close in terms of damage. As for Laudacia and Kawakaze, there was a clear winner in Laudacia, although I believe I did not use two oxytorps for Kawakaze, so she still has some room to scale. The final test was a direct comparison between Felix and Laudacia. Even though Laudacia was buffing Felix's gun damage, her damage was still noticeably ahead. However, the total damage seems to be higher with Laudacia compared to Mogador, meaning Mogador was once again likely finishing battle sooner. It's difficult to test Mogador and Laudacia side by side directly, because not only does Laudacia significantly buff Mogador, but there is only one twin 138.6 to go around. I believe that Mogador is slightly stronger alone than Laudacia, Although if you are running the two together, then Laudacia might actually be stronger, similar to a Shinano and Haku situation. In any case, Laudacia is extremely competent for an SSR destroyer. Not only is her personal damage high, but her survivability is solid, and she has an excellent partner in crime in Mogador. The combination of Mogador and Laudacia is in my opinion better than the combination of Felix plus any other Iron Blood destroyer of your choice, whether it be Z46, Auto, or Z1. After that, I tested Kasumi Meta and Ognavoy. Both used plus 10 equipment with no oxytorps. Kasumi Meta was not oathed, while Ognavoy was. While Ognavoy did perform better, keep in mind that Kasumi Meta has a torpedo buff, scales much better with oxytorps, and is also tankier. In fact, I believe that Kasumi with one oxytorp is still bulkier than Ognavoy with two survivability auxiliaries, so with everything taken into account, I believe Kasumi Meta to be better than Ognavoy overall. The last ship I tested was Wichita Meta. She actually had no trouble surviving on the brink of death in chapter 13, and once she got low, she started dealing almost double of Drake's damage. You can see her damage ramp up as the battle number increased. Whether or not this consistency can be carried through to higher stages is uncertain, but at least up until chapter 13, she can do quite a lot of work. Anyway, that's all I have for this video. Thanks for watching and 